Hello, I'm Pastor Joel Silverman. Thank you for watching Regeneration Television Broadcast. It's my hope that through this message you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of His Word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. So we are going to start on 2 Timothy. Now, if you remember, we did 1 Timothy. I'm going to encourage everybody to read the book of 2 Timothy. Uh, it is one of my favorite books in the Bible. We're going to talk about why that is. And uh, this is a book that even as we go through it, uh, each one of us, uh, Pastor Joel, Pastor Lisa, and myself are going to take different chapters. But as we go through it, we're really going to see, it's like an expose on today's times. When you read this book, you say, oh my gosh, this couldn't have been written 2,000 years ago. This is, this is today. This is what's happening in the world around us. And so the Holy Spirit, who always knows what's going on, uh, is preparing the church, even as he did many, many years ago. He's preparing the church through all of the ages, but especially for the age that we're living in. You know, many times we hear the expression, we live in the last days. How many of us think we're living in the last days? Well, Rick Renner is a wonderful Bible scholar, teacher, and he says we are living in the last of the last days, because the last days actually started with Pentecost. Because in that time, if you remember when Peter got up and stood before the, the throng of people, he said, this is that. This is what the prophet Joel declared would happen. And so from that point, that outpouring of the Spirit actually began the last days. Now, if we are... 2,000 years later, help, into those last days, I would say, I don't know how many more days are left, I hope there's a few, but uh, we are certainly in a, an ending of times, as God would say it. So uh, let's just bow our head in prayer. Father, we just want to give this wonderful word to you, because you are the living word. And Lord, we rejoice in your word. I pray for every one of us to embrace the word of God. There is nothing like the word of God. It is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword to divide between our souls and our spirit, to take out the things that are not of God and to put within us the things that are of God. And I pray this day a rich deposit of the things that are of God in all of us. Amen? So, 2 Timothy. This is a little passage that was a, a note in my Bible. Listen to what this says. Famous last words, it's more than a cliche. When notable men and women of influence are about to die, the world waits to hear their final words of insight and wisdom. Then those quotes are repeated worldwide. This is also true with a dying loved one. Gathered at his or her side, the family strains to hear every word whispered, syllable upon syllable, of blessing, encouragement, and advice, knowing that this will be a final message. Now, I have lived through both my parents dying, and I can tell you at those times in their life, that was exactly where I was at. You know, at their bedside, listening, being with them. Some of us have walked through recent deaths here. And you know how important it is. Because when someone is leaving this world, they're not going to leave a message like, you know, make sure you get the garbage out on Monday night. They're going to leave a message that is from their heart. I want you to think about, as we go through this letter, if you were dying, and you knew you were dying, what would you want to say to your loved ones? Because that is the condition that Paul, who is writing this letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, is in. That is the condition he's in. So one of the most knowledgeable, influential, and beloved men in history is the Apostle Paul. In the book of 2 Timothy, these are his last words. Paul was facing death. He's not dying of a disease in a sterile hospital with loved ones gathered nearby. He's very much alive, but his condition is terminal. Convicted as a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, Paul sat in a cold Roman prison. This is a dungeon, rat-infested, filthy, 
This isn't like Nassau County Jail. Cut off from the world with a death sentence hanging over his head solely because of his faith in Christ. Nothing he had done wrong only because he believed in Jesus Christ. Paul knew, and we're going to see as we go through these chapters, that soon he would be executed. He knew this. He said, My, he has run the race. God began to tell him, your timing is up. And so he writes his final thoughts to his spiritual son, Timothy, passing to him the torch of leadership, reminding Timothy of what was truly important the most important significant things and encouraging him to keep his faith in Christ. Do you know there is nothing that you and I have that is as valuable as our faith in Christ? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Any of our assets piled together could not be that much compared to our faith in Christ. And this is what Apostle Paul is saying to his young disciple. This is what you need to be reminded of. Imagine how many times Timothy must have reread every word of that letter. It was the last message from his beloved spiritual father and mentor, Paul. This is the most intimate and moving of all of Paul's letters because it is his last. There's never been another person like Paul, the missionary apostle. He was a man of deep faith, undying love, constant hope, tenacious conviction, and profound insight. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us today this same message. As we read through 2 Timothy, we need to be reminded that we are reading the very last words. He will never write another word. And so the Holy Spirit is reminding even us today, when final letters come forth, they have the depth of that person's heart to be expressed to those he's leaving behind. So let's look at our first PowerPoint, 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 4. The opening is his salutation, of course, to this son that he loves. And in verse 4, he says, I am longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. You know, I could weep when I read this. Because I'm just imagining, he knows he's not really going to see him again. But he's saying, I'm longing that that would have happened. For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that is in you as well. He knows Timothy well. They have gone on many missionary trips together. They have labored for the gospel. They've laid down their lives together. And so the Holy Spirit here is reminding all of us today, this is the generational faithfulness of God. I want to encourage every person here, do not give up praying for your household. Timothy's father was not a believer. Scripture never indicates that he became a believer. But his grandmother was a believer and his mother was a believer. They were converted Gentiles that at some point came into the gospel. And so, so Paul is saying to Timothy, remember God's generational faithfulness. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to understand how significant it is when we pray for our households. You know, one of the things the enemy wants us to always doubt is that God is hearing our prayer. And you say, oh, I've prayed so long. I've prayed so many years. I don't see anything. Maybe they're even getting harder. But God is saying, hang in there. Hang in there. You don't know what God is going to do, and you will never know how he's going to do it. I have seen God break people in my life that I would have said in a million years, this is never going to happen, but God but God. So we need to be reminded, whoever we are praying for, God wants to bring forth a legacy. These young children, this is the legacy, but God wants you as parents to bring forth the word of the Lord so that they can stand in the day that they live in. Our family is our first mission field. Think about it. 
Sometimes they're the hardest. <laughs> Sometimes they're the ones we say, please send me to Africa, but don't send me to whoever. <laughs> but that isn't God's heart. So God wants us to be prayerful for our families and the generations to come. See a legacy in the spirit, whether it's natural children, whether it's spiritual children. God wants you to father and mother some ones that you will have a spiritual legacy that will be coming forth. And Timothy was not only the legacy of Paul and what he had sown in, but Timothy was the legacy of this grandmother and this mother. He was their good fruit. Let's look at our next verse. So, <clears throat> 2 Timothy 1.6. Paul says, I'm putting you in memory of all these things so that by remembering them, you might stir up the gift of God that is in you. Who's supposed to stir up the gift of God? You are. You are. You are. Oh, it's not the pastor's job, Pastor Lisa. <laughs> you are supposed to stir up the gift of God within you. Now listen, at this time this letter is being written, there is tremendous persecution that has broken out against Christians. Remember when Timothy, when we read 1 Timothy, we talked about how he was in a pagan society, the church is in Ephesus, it's all pagan worship, and how the Lord obviously was doing a mighty, mighty work. Well, this is several years later, and so tremendous persecution has really come forth. The Roman government is now under the Emperor Nero, who is literally known as a madman, and he is putting Christians to death by the hundreds. This is what is being faced by Christians at the time this is being written. Peter will die a martyr's death in that persecution, so will Paul. They are counting on the next generation of believers to carry the torch. It is vital now, these apostles, these ones who knew the Lord or walked uh, quickly after his years on earth, they're saying the next group, that next generation of believers, they've got to get this. They've got to get this. So they are counting on them to be able to pick up that torch. Remember, they're in the midst of a pagan society. And Paul is basically saying to Timothy, remember how God has delivered you in the past. We have to be reminded what God has done for us. Isn't it easy to forget what God has done? You know when the next new problem comes up and all of a sudden it's like everything flies out of your head and we forget what the Lord has done? We're almost taken by surprise. I can't believe I'm going through this. Oh my gosh, why this kind of a problem, not this? And we forget easily what God has done and his faithfulness. So the apostle is saying to his, his student here, his disciple, stir up that gift of faith. Start to remember what God did for you. Now look, nobody is minimizing what Timothy is going through. If we were being persecuted like they were being persecuted, how many of us would stand in that day? Dear Jesus, help us. If you knew leaving here, you're going out and being thrown into a lion's den, this is what happened. Children, mothers, fathers. We have to understand persecution is very real. How many of us recognize persecution is very real today in many countries throughout the world? Children are being burned to death for their belief in Christ Jesus. It is real. America, wake up. So the apostle is saying, remember how God has delivered you and rescued you. Paul is saying to Timothy, get your eyes off of the present trial. Get past the fears that you're feeling. God has brought you through and he's going to bring you through this. Let's look at our next one. Why? Because in verse 7, the word says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is a verse every, script, every Christian should know, have in their heart, and hold on to. We must have scriptures within our heart, memorized, that are part of our makeup. So when we go through the trial and tribulation, we can say, wait, 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 wait. God didn't give me a spirit of fear. He gave me a spirit of power. Whose power is that? 
the Holy Spirit's power. It's the Spirit's power. And the love is the love of God. That word fear or timidity, some translations say, is literally the word cowardice. And so Paul is saying God didn't give you a spirit that's going to shrink or a soul that's going to shrink and be cowardly in a time of trial. God doesn't give us that spirit of fear, but one of courage, because it takes great courage to live as a Christian in the world. How much courage does it take you showing up at your job Monday morning? What are all the things you have to deal with from people? People who put you down because of who you are, what you represent to them. It is not easy to live as a believer in Christ and to hold on to our faith in Christ because the world is anti-Christ. And Paul and Timothy lived in that same world that was anti-Christ as we do. That's why we are admonished in Scripture not to love the world. God's word literally says, 1 John 2, 15, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. My husband likes to say, wear this world like a loose garment. Don't attach yourself to the things of this world because they are fleeting. God wants us to attach ourselves to the things that are eternal. Eternal truths, not fleeting truths. The reality is we are all passing through this life. Amen. Don't put your roots down here. Right. Did you ever wonder at times why you're so disappointed in things in this world, in people, in this life? Because God is reminding you, hey, you're just passing through here. This isn't our home. Our home is in heaven. Matter of fact, the Lord is preparing a home for you and I as I speak. Imagine that. A home that's going to have exactly what you would like in it. Think about that. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. But God gives us the power of his spirit to live in this fallen world. He gives us his love for all people, and he gives us a sound mind, a mind that will not collapse when challenges and trials come, but a mind that is focused on God and will remain stable and fixed on God, a mind that knows the word of God and holds fast to it because the word literally tells us, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. We literally have the mind of Christ as a believer in Christ. Our problem is our own thoughts that overwhelm us and we forget we have the mind of Christ. That's why the word also says, take every thought, what? Captive. Captive to Christ. Take those ungodly thoughts captive to Christ. You know, when situations come on and trials come on, people cave in under that because of their mind, the fear that it wells up, the emotion of fear, the mind that starts running forward and projecting the fear. And so Paul is saying, in Christ, we don't have to go that way. In the world we live in today, antidepressants, anti-anxiety pills, billion dollar business. Why? Fears, anxieties, thoughts that are running wild. People that don't know they have a God who loves them, a God who will care for them, a God who will walk with them. Everything we sang this morning, a God who is good. Do you know most people in the world today would never agree that God is good? They think he's angry, they think he's vindictive, and they think he's against them. Now if I thought God was angry, vindictive, and against me, let me tell you, I'd be full of fear myself. Wouldn't we all be full of fear? So you see how the thinking takes over and we need as believers to understand, no, no, we have the word of God. What does the word of God say? What's the truth of who he is? Let's look at our next PowerPoint. Therefore, the word continues, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And Paul says, nor of me his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, 
not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time even began. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. You know, when the chips come down and things happen in any one of our life, you're going to see who your true friends are. You're going to see who the ones are that will really stand with you. Because what he's saying here is, Timothy, don't be ashamed of me because I'm in jail. Remember, I haven't done. He's not in there as a, as a convict. He hasn't murdered somebody. And so he's saying to this young man, these things happen in life. Suffering is going to happen. You may be unjustly uh, accused of having done something just as he was. And so what starts to happen then is people begin to flee. People begin to leave you in the midst of a difficult situation because of their own fears, because of their own immaturity, or maybe they're not so grounded in the word. And so when suffering comes, people don't like to be around suffering. People do not embrace suffering. It's our security in the Lord that helps us reach out to those that are suffering. And Paul is experiencing what you and I have experienced or will experience, those who leave and fly away in the midst of your suffering. And he's saying to this young disciple, share with me in these sufferings. Don't run away. Share with me. Walk with me. Pray with me. Support me. No, you can't really do anything about this, but you can do those things about it. And he's saying, but God has called us not according to our works. Maybe this wasn't Paul's plan to be in jail at this point. Maybe he thought he was still going to have opportunity to continue to preach the gospel. But God... He says, but according to God's own purpose and grace, which was given to me, it's the plan of God that starts to unfold in his life. When plans don't work out the way you and I want them to work out, we suffer. It causes us suffering, doesn't it? And we feel like we're suffering. And this is exactly what Paul is addressing here. That's going to happen in our Christian walk. You know, the days in, in Christianity of name it, claim it, they never should have been, but they certainly aren't now. There is no naming and claiming. You've got to mature. You've got to grow up. You're going to suffer. You have to walk through things knowing that God will walk with you through them, just as Paul did. No man, probably separate from Christ, suffered as much as Paul did for the gospel. He suffered in every which way, but you never hear one complaint. Amen. He wasn't sitting in this jail saying, I've gone through stripes, I've been stoned to death, I've been left for dead, uh, I went through this, they turned again. This is what happens to me now? <laughs> Sound like any of us? Probably. Probably. That's an ouch. Not one complaint, but rejoice in the suffering. It's amazing how Paul, as the older man in this situation, he's sitting in a rat-infested dungeon. I mean, that alone, we are so spoiled. Can you just imagine? We complain if the air conditioner doesn't work. I have to be at a 9 o'clock meeting. What do they want from me? And here he is sitting in a rat-infested dungeon, filth, filth, in a Roman jail awaiting his own death sentence. And yet, how the Holy Spirit is using him to bolster, steady, and reassure this young man. His focus is not on himself. 
and what he is suffering, it's on this young one that's going to be left behind. How clearly we see here the need for the wisdom and the experience of the older generation to speak into and steady the younger generation, especially when trials come. Because when trials come, fears arise. And when fears arise, people want to run from the situation. Each generation needs the one above it to speak wisdom and truth, stability into them. Not no, no, you're going to get through this. It's okay. Because the older generation is just speaking from more experience in that area. And they're able to say, God has been faithful to me, and he will be faithful to you as well. Don't give up your faith in Christ. So Paul is urging and reminding Timothy, stand firm in the truth, even when it includes suffering. Stand firm in the truth of God's word when you go through things that are so beyond you. Don't throw in the towel, this doesn't work, it means nothing. That's nonsense. In that time of trial, you have to stand firm. Your own faith is being tested. Our faith has to be tested to see, is it true? Or are you just in for a good ride? And when the troubles come, you're like, I'm out of here. I've seen a lot of people do that. I've seen many Christians start off on fire. But Peter, 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 out. What happened? Their faith was being tested. And rather than standing in that test and still believing on the God of the promises of the word, they came under the doubt that the enemy threw at them. See, that enemy is going to be right at your shoulder when you go through a trial. And he's going to say, you really believe God's with you in this? You really think God's going to see you through this? Where's God now? Thought everything was great. What's, what's the problem? Where's God? Where's your hooray, hurrah, hallelujah? He knows us well. He's no fool. And that's the time we have to stand firm. No matter what. You know, one of the passages in the Bible that has always played a big part in my own heart because God spoke this to me many, many moons ago, is those three children, the three uh, Israel children in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you. And what did they say to that king? We will believe in our God. We will not bow to another God. And our God will save us, but even if he does not. Let me tell you something, church. That's maturity. That's faith. That's a grown-up, no matter what their ages were. That's a grown-up. No matter even if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to, the way I've prayed, the way I believe, the way I fasted for, my God is still a good God. I will still believe in him, and I will hold fast to the truth of the word of God. That is a test we will all go through. Nobody escapes these kind of tests. Oh, we wish we could, but we do not escape them. We do not escape them. So in this time of mounting persecution, Timothy might have even become afraid to preach. Remember, he's hearing, he's knowing. His own congregation is in jeopardy. How many of them were even sent to the lion's den? We don't even know those facts. He knows what's going on. He's no fool. And his fears are based on facts. Not conjecture or projection or imagination. His fears are based on fact because they were being arrested, persecuted, tortured, and put to death by the government on a daily basis. Dear Jesus, help us. That's all I can say. Let's look at our next PowerPoint.
So Paul tells Timothy, join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Basically, Paul is saying, Timothy, expect suffering. Expect it, son. You're not going to escape it. But also expect God to give you the strength to go through the suffering and to use it to glorify Christ. That's how our testimony is formed, through overcoming the trials we're facing, not running away from them. That's the place you and I grow up. Let's look at our next one. The opposite is also true. When we allow people or situations to intimidate us, we neutralize our effectiveness for God. In essence, you lose your testimony. Because now how do you stand <clears throat> when the chips are against you? Now where is your hallelujah? Now where is your God is good? See, the world watches, and the world is very discerning. And they want to see the real deal. They don't want to see some people that go through things okay because there's an absence of problems in their life. When there's an absence of problems in your life, and you say, oh, I have the peace of the Lord, well, happy day. But what about when the problems come? Are you still saying, I have the peace of the Lord? We mix up those two things. We think in absence of problems, oh, I have the peace of the Lord. Well, we should have the peace of the Lord. There's no problems. But what really happens when those problems come? Do I still have the peace of the Lord? Or am I wavering? When I waver, I neutralize my testimony in the Lord. But the power of the Holy Spirit is working within us to overcome our fears. You know, let me remind all of us, myself included, everybody has fears and we all get afraid. That's a reality. But I also remind myself, God knows me and he knows my fears. He knows my frame, the word of God says. <clears throat> he knows what you and I can stand and what we can't stand. But he also knows what he's going to want to walk us through and will give us the grace to do it. Amen? Amen. Let's look at uh, verses 9 through 12. Next PowerPoint. Who has saved us, Paul says, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works? but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the gospel. In that verse, he literally gives the gospel message. He literally says who Christ is, his death, his resurrection. He literally gives the whole gospel. But notice he says that who has saved us and called us with a holy, call, a holy calling, not according to our works. Your life may work out very differently from what you had planned for it. How many of us would say, oh yeah, oh yeah. And that is a reality for each and any one of us. It's God's plan, not your plan, not my plan. Sometimes that's really hard for us to digest, but we need to. That's the laying down, the surrendering, not my way, Lord, but your way. You do, you have your way, you show me, you tell me, and God will do the rest. He also knew what he was appointed as. He knew the gifts of God in him. That's why he's reminding Timothy, this is who I am, now stir up the gifts of God in you. Who are you, Timothy, who was also a preacher, was also an apostle, obviously a teacher, obviously a pastor. He's saying, stir up those gifts in you. Do you know you need to know what the gifts of God are in you? What are the gifts that God has given you? Because if you don't even know what they are, how are you using them? We need to know the gifts of God. <clears throat> what has he called you to do? What has he called you to become? What area of your life is he working on to mature the gifts of God within you? Paul is saying in this, 
This is my mission in life. I am that preacher. I am that teacher. I am that apostle. Now Paul, to our knowledge, was not married, did not have children. But even if he did, his calling was still in this spiritual arena. See, the blessings of God, of a marriage and children and a home and all the blessings we've had are wonderful. But that's not your calling in the Lord. You need to know, what am I called to do? Am I called to be a worshiper? Am I called to be an administrator? Am I called to be a pastor? What is the calling? What are the gifts that God has put in me so that I can stir them up and I can bring them out into the body of Christ? Do you know the body needs your gifts? That's what makes the body flow because you're going to have gifts I don't have. But we need your gifts. Each joint knit, knitted to the other. And this is what makes the body flow together. Paul is saying, know what your calling is, son. Remind yourself. Remind the Lord. And stand on that calling. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. He says, so it is for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. Oh, I love this verse. Convinced that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. This verse, highlight, star it, memorize it, and get it into your person. He says, for this reason, I know I'm suffering. I know why I'm suffering. But he says, I am not ashamed. We never have to be ashamed when we go through suffering for Christ. Not talking about suffering because we did something wrong. We went and robbed a bank. Well, obviously, a little different story. We're talking about being suffering because of our stand for Christ. But he says, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded, I am convinced that he is able. Are you persuaded? Are you convinced about the Lord in your own life? I mean convinced. No doubt. No question mark. No little, uh, I'm not exactly sure about this. That's what God wants to take away from you. This is why Paul could face his death in which he was beheaded with peace because he knew whom he was committed to and he knows that Christ will keep the things that he has committed to him. We need to know exactly that same thing. This knowing isn't just showing up at church on Sunday as great and wonderful as that is. Do you know when you get to know Christ like this? In your own home, quiet time with him, in the word, listening to the Holy Spirit, letting God speak to you, writing down what the Lord is saying. The intimacy you spend with the Lord is where the conviction in your heart grows. When I minister to people and they have no conviction in their heart of the love of God for them, I know they spend very little time with the Lord. Because when you start to spend time with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to meet with you. See, God wants to be intimate with his own people. The intimacy a husband and a wife would know together. That depth of intimacy. God wants you to know him in the depths of your being so that no matter what you face in life, you will know God is with me. I am convinced my God will never leave me. I am convinced he's going to see me through whatever. I am persuaded. It's not just a little persuasion. That's why I put that word in there. He was convinced. It literally is the word convicted to his inmost being that God was good and God was good to him. Sitting in a prison, 
rats nibbling at his toes, knowing he may never see anyone again in the body of Christ. He is convinced in him who he has committed his life to. That's some conviction. I believe the Western church doesn't have a clue, my own opinion. But we're going to have to get a clue. We're going to have to get a clue, really seriously. In the face of impending death, this is an overcomer's testimony. This is a man of victory. So he's already, he already has the victory crown because of his stand in this situation. Paul is saying to Timothy, have no doubt of who your God is. If he was good to you in the good times, he, there's no shadow of turning in him. He is still good to you in the hard times. Know who your God is. Be convinced he will be with you in all things. And he will enable you. He enables us to go through trials. You know, sometimes we think about trials and sitting here we think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could ever go through that. But it's because you're not going through it now. But when you were called to go through it, guess what God's going to give you in that moment? Grace to walk it through. That's why when people walk it through, they say, I can't believe I just went through that. Because you were graced to walk it through. We don't get grace sitting in church on a Sunday morning. It's great, but you're not going to be graced to go through your worst sufferings. That's going to happen in that moment. Corey Ten Boom always told the story of her father. This woman went to a German Nazi camp, concentration camp, and as a little girl, she would say to her father, you know, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? And like this, when trials come and worries come, and her father would say to her, when, what happens when you go on a train? And she would say, at the last minute, the conductor in those years would give you your ticket and you would get on the train. And her father said, when this happens, or if this happens, or when trial happens, when it occurs, God will give you the ticket to get on the train and you will go through that. You want a testimony? That woman lived in that concentration camp, all of her family died around her, and by a, quote, fluke, she was released to tell her story. Magnificent, the hiding place, magnificent testimony that in her loneliness and faithfulness, she, she would cry out to the Lord, again, in a dark hell hole, at times even just a put in almost a prison area, and she would be so lonely, and she said, all of a sudden she saw an ant that would come out in the morning, and she'd look at this ant, and she felt it was literally God's provision for her. And she talked to that little ant like you talk to a little pet. And the night would come and the ant would crawl back in, in the wall. And the next morning the ant would come back out. And she said she began to see how even in that, how God provided. Let me tell you, church, God's provisions are not going to be like you are my thoughts of provision. But it is going to be his provision. And we receive it as such, the goodness and the kindness of God. All right, what verse are we on for this reason? 12. All right, next one. So our God, for this reason, he said, I am also suffering. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Jumping ahead, jumping ahead. 13. He says to him, so retain, keep the standard of the word of God. Those are the sound words which you have heard from me, Paul says, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard them through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This treasure which has been entrusted to you. What's the treasure? The gospel. The gospel is your treasure. The gospel is the truth of who Christ is, what he has done for you, and your faith in Christ. That's the treasure that lies within us. It's not even the gifts of God. They're great. But the treasure 
is the gospel, the word of God. That is our keeping power. Gifts don't keep us. God's word keeps us. It is a foundation. It's a baseline that we stand on. And Paul's warning, do not allow the gospel you have heard from me to be changed in any way. Wow. Hello today. Think the gospel's being changed a little bit? Watered down a little bit? What was sin is in sin. What was good is now bad. The word of God says what was evil is going to be good. What was good is going to be evil. We're living in it. Paul is fully aware his time is now very short on this earth. And he is telling this spiritual son the most important and significant messages of his own heart. This is what the Holy Spirit is putting on Paul's heart, not only for Timothy, but for all of us who are going to follow. He's fully aware of false teachers that are coming into the church who will twist and manipulate the word for their own selfish purpose. He's fully aware of his young spiritual son's weaknesses, his fears, and his vulnerabilities. And next one, and he's saying, son, these things I'm telling you are of utmost importance. Now hold on to them and guard them as a treasure which has been given to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. All of scripture is given by the Holy Spirit. Not only for the people that it was written to in this year and in those early years, but to us many years later. Who of us would say, oh, this word doesn't apply at all? Of course it applies. It applies to us today with what we're being faced with. And so God is being very, very diligent. He's saying, hold on to these things. Your faith, the gospel, this is the most important. And next one. Oh, I'm sorry, stay there. I'm sorry, stay there. Son, he says, these things I'm telling you are of the utmost importance. Hold on to them. Now he's going to end just this portion, because we know the rest of the letter is all part of it, but he ends this portion of his letter with a very honest and vulnerable heart, not covering up, but teaching his young son, you will have many trials, but there is one trial that leaders will face, different from anyone else. The one trial is the trial of the desertion, the abandonment, the backbiting of those you have discipled, mentored, loved, cared for, trained up, and laid your lives down for. And he wants this young man to know Timothy, you're not going to escape that. Let's look at our verse, next one. Verse 15 through 18. He says, I'm sure you know by now that everyone in the province of Asia deserted me, even Phygelius and Hermogenes. Now, those are pretty intense words. Everyone in the province of Asia deserted me. He names these two names. Perhaps they were leaders. We don't know who they are. But he certainly does cite them. He says, but God bless Onesiphorus and his family. Many's the time I've been refreshed in that house. And he makes a key sentence here. And he wasn't embarrassed a bit that I was in jail. Brings up the same message of believers forsaking him because he's being jailed for the gospel. The first thing he says of this man he did when he got to Rome was look me up. May God on the last day treat him as well as he treated me. And then there was all the help he provided in Ephesus and he says to Timothy, but you even know that better than I because Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus. So he cites the one man of the blessing. When he speaks of Anesiphorus looking him up and finding him, this man had to diligently dig to find where is Paul? What, what dungeon has he been thrown into? This isn't like he can call up somebody and say, hi, I'm looking for Paul the Apostle. 
He had to make a diligent effort to seek this man out, knowing that he wanted to be a blessing to this father of faith. So here you have some that Paul has trained, loved, and ministered to who have abandoned and forsaken him. And then you have one that is proving his faithfulness, his love, and his commitment to a spiritual father who's sitting in a jail. Choices. We all make choices. Isn't it interesting that these two men are written for the thousand of years in scripture as deserters to the Apostle Paul? Who do you want to be? You want to be as a one of Sephoris, one of Sephoris? You want to be as a Vigilius and a Hermogenes? These are choices that we make. And you make them when things are going well in your life. You make commitment to people that God has placed in your life because God has placed them in your life. And you prove yourself to be faithful and true and committed and mature as a believer. No matter what other people are like, you commit yourself to the Lord to be that type of person. I would never want my name to be written for the multitudes to follow that I was a deserter, that when the going got rough, I was out of here, that I turned against others who had mentored and led me down that road. You know, nobody arrives on their own. Everybody gets here because of somebody else. Are you going to be true to that somebody else? Or are you selfish and immature and just see can't see past the tip of your own nose. I don't believe that for our church. I believe that we are all here because we all want to grow and grow up. We all see the need to grow up. How many of us would say, I really have a need to grow up? I know I do. Now, believe me, I'm not just sitting here as, oh, the pastor. If anything, we're held to a greater accountability. God have mercy on us. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website. Also, if you're ever in the area, stop by. We would love to have you at New Generation Church at Sunday service. Again, thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.